right, hello everybody. I'm Mr. King. I'm here to talk to you today about how to be successful in the science fair. First thing you might be wondering is why do you have to do a science fair? It's a common question we get. And there's a couple good reasons right here. Number one, it's a great and rewarding experience. It helps further understand the scientific method and some of the things that you're learning in your class. Also, the Delaware Valley Science Fair, which comprises New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, present close to three million dollars in awards and scholarships each year. And you can further advance from there to achieve even more uh, awards or scholarships to a college that you may be interested in. The first step in the science fair is choosing your topic. And this can be pretty daunting because there is an unlimited number of topics. So a lot of times students spin their wheels on this section. So to help you with that, the first thing we suggest doing is some brainstorming. You're going to be working with this project for several weeks, so you want it to be something that interests you. Ms. Lambert and I came up with a list of some sample brainstorming ideas. You can see up at the top, there's five ideas here, from types of food and test scores down to animal activity during the day versus night. A lot of these ideas we've seen several times in the past. Um, but there's so many different variations of these that you could work with um, to make this a, a successful science fair project. When you're done brainstorming, you want to develop a list of questions regarding your topic that you choose. So once you narrow down that, that, the topics that you're interested in to one that you want to work with, you want to develop a bunch of questions that you don't know. The idea is that you want to work on a science fair project and ask a question that you don't already know the answer to. Otherwise, it's kind of a waste of time. So here's some sample questions we came up with. There's eight here. What type of animals are active during the day? What types of animals are more active at night? All the way down to, do animal preferences change throughout their life cycle? From there, you want to create a testable question from your list. A testable question is a question that you could actually come up with and develop a procedure to actually test to find the answer to. Again, you don't want to already know the answer to your question. Down here we have two testable questions that we developed from this number eight question here in our list. So we're going to work with in answering this question, do animal preferences change throughout their life cycle? And our two testable questions that we decided on were, do mealworms prefer moist or dry environments? And do beetles prefer moist or dry environments? Okay. To better understand this, you're going to go to the next step of, the, of, of our science fair process, which is to do some background research. You may not know a lot about mealworms or beetles or are they even connected. You may, that may be something that's new to you, and that's good. You want to do some research to find out a little bit more about your topic so that you know what you're getting into, and if it's something that you're not interested in, then we can go back to square one, but at least you have a little bit of an idea of where you're going, and you're, you're knowledgeable. We don't want uh, students getting involved with a project that, that is going to turn out to, to be something that's not successful. So for example, you'd want to study some things and research things such as the life cycle of a mealworm, get some basics. You might also want to research other experiments that have been done on animal behavior or even more specifically on mealworms so that you can see what other scientists have done and it might give you some really good ideas on how to develop your procedure. Another thing you might want to research is what types of resources they need to survive. If you're dealing with a living organism, uh, you want to make sure that you know what they need to survive so that you can be successful. One of the most important parts of your science fair project is identifying your independent variable as well as your dependent variable. Your independent variable is what you are changing and your dependent variable is what you are going to measure based on the change that you just made. So, look at this particular experiment. It says... How do different chemicals and fertilizers affect plant growth? Um, what you are going to be changing is going to be the fertilizer. So your independent variable is going to be the fertilizers. And what should happen would be that this will have an effect on the plant growth. And plant growth will be what you're measuring. So some should be taller, some should not be as tall. What you are then going to do is come up with a graph. So eventually, you're going to be able to make your graph with your independent variable is always going to be on the bottom. This is often even going to be time for many of your experiments. And your dependent variable is going to be what you measure. So in this case, it has a car wash. The number of cars were the independent. So based upon if you have more cars, you're going to have more money.
For your materials and your procedure, the easiest way to do it is set up your data table to start with. After you set up your data table, you know what you're trying to measure. So then go through a list of things you can do, a real basic one at first, and you can fine tune it later. And as you're doing that, on the side of your paper, just list down all the materials that you're going to need to accomplish this. If your material list becomes quite expensive or impractical, then we might need to start again and go back to your brainstorming and come up with a project that you can actually complete. Here's the dreaded part of the science fair. This is the paperwork part. So if you have not already received paperwork from your teacher and you are in 6th to 12th grade, you're going to have to go on to the ISEF website, which is right here at the bottom where it says scienceforsociety.org. Um, and here is an example of that particular paper. So there's multiple papers. This is a great one because it shows you if you are going to complete all these different projects, what paperwork you need. So if you're using humans or vertebrates, biological agents, all of these things, it tells you all the other papers that you have to fill out. Um, these can all be turned into your teacher. When you go onto their website, you can type into these sections and then just save it and print it that way. Analyzing and communicating your results, you should do at least three trials. In biology, when you have limited time and resources, three trials is still basically the minimum one. If you're doing something else where maybe you're doing a physics project where the supplies are not needed, you can try to aim for at least 10 trials. The more trials you have, the better your research is going to be. Um, you want to keep your raw data in your research paper and or your logbook. All of your projects should have a logbook that you keep for the entire time you're doing your experiments. You're going to create a summary data and that's basically what we just showed you, but I have another one as well. Let me see. This here would be raw data, where you have your age group here, your reaction time. So every single one that you did, you're recording. So if you have lots of information, you can just keep them in your logbook. If you don't, you can actually make a raw data table. And then this would be a summary data. So you're showing the trend. So especially if you're in high school, you should be able to find a trend, which means a graph that easily shows the relationship between light intensity and photosynthesis. So in this case, the greater the light intensity, the faster the photosynthesis rate is going to be. And eventually, it starts to level off here. So going back. Um, all of your data should be recorded and presented in table and graph form. Um, everything on your board should also be typed. There should be no handwriting on your boards ever, even your titles. One of the most important parts that's the most red part of your experiment is going to be your abstract. It should be under 250 words. Um, this can also be considered like a trailer for your particular science fair project. You're describing the purpose of it and you're also trying to have this hook. You're trying to motivate the reader to want to read your entire project. You're going identif to identify your basic approach, but you're not going to go into all the details of your procedure and you want to have some type of quantitative result, so some type of number or trend that's actually happening. Once you're done with this part, you are going to create your board. So many of our students just start gluing things onto the board as soon as they get them. It doesn't always work out so well. You need to plan to lay your board out, put everything on top of it, figure out what's going to work the best for you. Not all of them have to be in the same exact order. Your title you should be able to see from six feet away and read it. It's helpful if your focal point, so usually the center of your board is going to be your summary data, which will be beautiful color, hopefully, graphs. And everything should be attached to your board, including your abstract. You should have other copies of your abstract to give to the judges.